Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, dear friends, and we are pleased to welcome you to the opening of the Ocean Lecture Hall as a part of the Ocean and Climate Science events, which we dedicate to the launch of the United Nations Decade of Ocean Science and Climate for Sustainable Development. This project was organized and initiated by Rossotrudnichistva, the Russian Federal Agency for the Commonwealth of Independent States, Compatriots, Living Abroad and International Humanitarian Cooperation. And our first lecture is presented by Christina Georget, who is the Senior Advisor for the Global Marine and Polar Programme of the International Union for Conservation of Nature. She is also Associate Professor at the Middle Bureau Institute of International Studies in Monterey, California. So she will present us the lecture on conserving marine biodiversity in the world's oceans beyond the national borders. Good afternoon and good evening, everybody. It is indeed a great pleasure to be here with you that I have the pleasure of talking today about um, sustaining marine biodiversity in areas beyond national jurisdiction. I'll be going through some of the challenges as well as the opportunities, some of the scientific advances that will make future cooperation and conservation possible. I've been involved in the discussions for the United Nations um, a great International Instrument for the conservation and sustainable use of marine biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction. This is called the BBNJ Agreement for many years, for nearly two decades now. So I hope to share with you some of the history behind the ideas, hopes, and negotiations for this important new international legal agreement. Then I'll be talking about pillars for progress. Where can we stand? Where can we go? And then end with hopefully a note of hope for where and what the future holds beyond today. So with that, I will begin with this wonderful map visualization of the ocean as we knew it in 2010. This is the culminating visualization, if you will, of the 10-year census of marine life. This was a private initiative that managed to gain the collaboration of scientists from over 80 countries around the world and to build the capacity and our understanding of the diversity, distribution, and abundance of marine life across our shared planet. These tiny little yellow lines that you see are the uh, results of a project to learn how to tag and then track large mammals, uh, but, um, elephant seals and um, tuna, if you will, as they cross the ocean basins from one end from California, where I was born, to Japan and Russia and back. That's, it also gave us new insights into who lives there, as well as their distribution across the ocean floor. The challenge is that this is just a snapshot in time, and we really need to better understand how all this comes in. For what we have also learned is that the world ocean is just one ocean. It is entirely interconnected, and the health and welfare of residents, both human and non-human, in one part of the ocean planet depend on the actions of another. The one ocean is singular, but it is also very rich in biological diversity and different kinds of habitats. I thought it'd be nice just to share some of my favorite photographs of life in the midwater column, as this one is, where fish line up um, vertically instead of horizontally, waiting for that moment to crawl and to swim up to the sunlit water column. The octopus that may be more intelligent than our dogs and cats, that really know how to wriggle in and out of many uncomfortable situations. The comb jellies and other types of gelatinous creatures that we're just starting to learn about, that they are one of the largest in mass of species on our planet that um, comprise an important role in the food webs. They're not just watery masses, but in fact are important food for sea turtles as well as squid. And then the humpback whales, the iconic species that we do share across our planet. 
that's humpback whales and gray whales and blue whales and fin whales, we know are increasingly vulnerable to our pollution from sound, from fishing gear, as well as from the chemicals that are coming into the ocean from all coasts. And then I really love these black corals that grow from hard substrate on the sea floor and then give habitat homes to a whole nother array of life. These deep sea corals can grow to be 3,000 and reefs to 10,000 years old. This glass sponge reef in the Gulf of Mexico has cousins in the um, off of Canada, but they found those to be 10,000 years old, providing habitat for an amazingly diverse array of life. It is this interconnectivity and interdisciplinarity to understand and manage the ocean that makes me so excited about being with you here today that um, with the Lomonosov Moscow State University, he really was a paradigm of polymath multidisciplinarity, but he was a walking individual, whereas many of us today need to rely on our colleagues in order to fill the many gaps in our knowledge about ocean space, ocean, ocean law, and ocean management. So as I said, I'm going to be talking about the challenges, opportunities, some of the recent scientific advances that have laid the groundwork for this new United Nations Agreement on Marine Biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction, the BBNJ agreement, and then the pillars of progress and what gives me hope. I am looking forward to your questions at the end. The challenges to the world ocean are of course many because we are um, interconnected both by commerce, by winds, by waves, by um, atmospheric deposition in many, many ways. And of course, by rising levels of carbon dioxide. These rising emissions from land, largely in the northern climes, has created what scientists are calling a deadly trio of stressors. These are manifested by um, warming, ocean warming. Temperatures are rising in many parts. Some parts are suffering from their own form of ocean heat wave. Um, rising levels of ocean acidification that can dissolve um, deep sea species such as corals, as well as many of the uh, pteropods, others of the shells that grow that support food webs all around. It's the deoxygenation is actually sucking the oxygen out of the water because warmer water holds less oxygen. It also causes the waters to stratify, stratify which means that important commercial species like tuna, as well as billfish, have less habitat in order to live, as well as less habitat to find food. As a result, we're seeing altered food webs where squid, large squid that are not edible by many of the core species are actually starting to take over certain ecosystems where larger fish species used to thrive. And then of course the warming seafloors, the, the temperatures are in fact reaching the deepest seafloors, is causing these frozen methane hydrates to release into the water column. Scientists still don't know exactly what the impact will be, but there is concern that it will combine with the um, increasing levels of carbon dioxide to make a potent mix and potentially be released into the marine, um, into the atmosphere, where methane is a much more potent greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide itself. And of course, ongoing impacts of human activities are reducing biodiversity and ecosystem resilience. I was shocked to discover that a, t a bluefin tuna in the Pacific Ocean could be fished down to less than 3% of its original biomass. My scientific colleagues try to um, explain this to UN delegates by saying what would happen if the population of Manhattan or any large city were reduced by 97.4%? How would you find a mate? How would you find your food? It is truly causing impacts that uh, um, undermine genetic resilience, ecosystem resilience, all the way up to how these species function in our biosphere. And of course, we know that um, there's connectivity between the top of the water, our atmosphere, as well as the depths of the sea floor, even down to 10,000 kil uh, kilometers deep in the Marianas Trench um, at 10 kilometers deep. 
and 5,000 um, meters deep, they found this can of Spam, which is sort of emblematic of a manufactured food that can last forever, but is no longer providing a sense of nutrition to the creatures of the deep and is only littering and occupying their habitat, like many of the plastic wastes, including um, abandoned and lost fishing gear that now pollute our ocean floor. And we know the world ocean is getting more crowded. There's more and more ships passing through the Suez Canal, the Panama Canal, dense patterns of traffic um, across the world ocean basins. This of course is complemented by heavy amounts of cables. 1.3 million kilometers of cables have been laid across the ocean floor. New interest in seabed mining, deep sea bottom fishing is wondering where is this all going to occur and not collide with one another. So we need to learn how to live together better. We need to learn how to live together in a co more coherent fashion. That's, um, as the scientists have been saying since for many years, 2011, 2015, and again more recently, is the greatest threat to the ocean really comes from our failure to deal quickly with the many threats that are undermining ocean health, ocean biodiversity, and ocean resilience. We really need to be working on all uh, fronts, if you will, in order to restore ocean health, because each one impact, whereas it may be slight by itself, can be magnified manifold when it comes to warmer waters or more acidified waters. I um, just wanted to bring up this most recent report on how we are doing as a planet in terms of managing and maintaining our global biodiversity uh, reservoir, if you were, our treasure chest. And the UN Secretary General has just re recently said in the foreword that we really need to step up action to safeguard and restore biodiversity. We know how to do that. The lessons that we have learned from the past are clear, from conservation, restoration of ecosystems, of course, climate action, as I'm going up this um, chart here on the right, reducing other drivers, um, harmful subsidies for fishing activities, as an example, sustainable production. How can we reduce our impact on natural resources, on the land, on the sea? And then, of course, are there things we don't need? Uh, can we reduce our consumption? Can we replace what we consume with more sustainably produced items? And of course, there are challenges under the international legal framework. The UN Convention on the Law of the Sea was a real gift in the 1970s and, what, and when it came, when it was finally signed in 1982. In many ways, it helped to prevent World War III because it provided an arena for our Soviet admirals and our US admirals, as well as the rest of the world, to come together to address common interests about how do we share, manage, and repair our common ocean, as well as what is mine and what is yours. Its ability to define exclusive economic zones out to 200 nautical miles and define the rights of freedom of access into those 200 nautical miles for peaceful purposes um, and under certain conditions and also solidified the high seas freedoms um, of fishing, navigation, um, marine scientific research. It really helped to, to set the legal framework for these past 30, 40 years. But now we're learning that the ocean is in fact a unified whole. We need to find ways to better manage across these many boundaries. Because the legal framework for areas beyond national jurisdiction is very fragmented. The United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea envisaged at the time, the 1970s, that regional fisheries management organizations could take care of all the problems with fisheries and the International Maritime Organization would help to ensure clean, clean and safe shipping. But what we have found is that the challenges of understanding what is happening in the ocean sometimes overwhelm the best intentions of fisheries managers, of shipping managers, and we need to find places to integrate and preserve our biological heritage. So what we have found is that under the Law of the Sea Convention, it makes it very difficult to have globally recognized marine protected areas that can provide a refuge for these many stressed species as well as ecosystems under 
climate change. I'll talk about this more later. Um, or for integrating biological diversity into our sectoral activities. Again, we found that ecosystem-based management is the wisest approach to managing, it, managing any form of human activity, and in fact is a core part of the Convention on Biological Diversity. But in many ways, we have a long ways to go. And again, because the ocean is divided into exclusive economic zones in the high seas, but the currents and the ecologically significant areas that we know about that are bounded in many times by those currents are not bounded by exclusive economic zone lines. So we need to find mechanisms for better complement what we do in areas beyond and areas within national jurisdiction, or they both can serve to um, undercut the efforts of either one to protect their resources, to conserve their biological diversity. So I've already said, we have learned that sectoral approaches for fishing, shipping, seabed mining are necessary because somebody needs to understand the real ins and outs of how a fish resource can be managed, but they also need to be complemented by an understanding of the ecosystem around them. This chart here looks at what a, um, the best practice for a tuna RFMO, how they would be doing indicators. That was the large triangles are, you know, does their text talk about ecosystem-based management? The red here for target species, um, have they achieved a sustainable level of production or are the fisheries outside safe biological limits? Here in this olive green is about bycatch species. Have they adopted measures to reduce the level of catch of seabirds and sea turtles and cetaceans? Trophic relationships, are they looking as they do in um, the Southern Ocean at the prey and predator relationships? Who eats whom and who outside the fisheries world depends on those fish resources? And then the habitats um, of, of the deep sea, but also the consolidated habitats in the open ocean water column. And as you can see in the rest of the graph, for the International Commission for the Conservation of Atlantic Tuna, International um, Indian Ocean Tuna Commission, and so forth, is that some of them are having a very difficult time managing and conserving habitats, protecting those trophic relationships, and ensuring that bycatch species are, that bycatch is managed and in fact prevented. And um, what the scientists are saying is that we are beginning to understand how this can be done, but it needs to be done in a coherent vision with a formalized plan with some level of accountability to the international community for progress being made or not being made. And hence, even though we have many measures that could aim to protect the marine environment or specific species. None of these are currently designed to protect all the features. Some, such as fisheries recovery zones, may be short-term and not systematic. They're not designed to protect the um, migratory route of a specific species, their spawning grounds or sorts. They may lack a mechanism to ensure coordination across boundaries and across even um, an ocean basin or across regional fisheries management organizations. And there may be a lack of common criteria or common advice that can truly hamper a coherent outcome. So what many in the conservation world are calling for when they look at the state of our planet, of our biodiversity and ecosystem services, as in this recent report from IPBES, the International Panel for Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, is the next step really needs to include transformative changes across economic, social, political, and technological levels if we are to succeed in living in harmony with nature into the 22nd century or even up to 2050. So what are the opportunities? I could be really depressed, and I hope I'm not depressing you too much uh, because I truly am an optimist by nature. That, and this is because I cut my teeth on learning international law from the perspective of the, Con um, the Convention on Biological Diversity that was agreed in 1992 as part of the UN World Summit on Sustainable Development. It truly recognized that the conservation of biological diversity, both within and beyond national boundaries, 
is a common concern of humankind. It uh, attempted to provide a platform for international cooperation and coordination, but because its provisions focus largely on the components of biological diversity within national jurisdiction, it was quickly recognized as not being sufficient to provide that common basis for legal advances, but it certainly has provided a solid basis for scientific and technological advances. I'll talk about that later. My first encounter with the CBD was followed quickly with an encounter of photos and videos of what was happening to the deep sea floor by advances in um, technology that allowed fishing vessels to basically rake the sea floor, corals such as we have just seen, with five ton trawl doors, leaving moonscapes in their wake. We went to the Convention on Biological Diversity, the, um, including with the government scientists from the government of Norway to bring this information to the global conservation community. And they said, yes, this is a huge concern, but we can only do so much. Let us see what we can do through the United Nations General Assembly, which is a more global body that encompasses all states from around the globe and not just the conservation ministries, which are often very weak within national governments. So by 2006, the United Nations General Assembly adopted a resolution to control the spread and the impacts of deep sea bottom fishing. And I'm quite excited about this because I was involved in these early stages of bringing um, attention to the vulnerability, the beauty of these deep sea ecosystems and understanding their distribution through the census of marine life of where there were deep sea corals, seamounts, that needed to be managed better. And so the UNGA resolution actually provides that both states and regional fisheries management organizations are to work to protect vulnerable marine ecosystems, such as these deep sea corals, and ensure sustainable fisheries. Deep sea fisheries, just like many deep sea species, are long, often long lived and slow to recover. And so they need a special level of care in ensuring their sustainability. And the way they set forward for managing these highly sus um, susceptible species um, to damage and to overfishing was a requirement for prior impact assessments for the adoption of management measures that could ensure, that could avoid the um, causing significant harmful effects and or close the area to fisheries. And the exciting and the precedent setting thing about this is they really said either you manage to avoid significant adverse impacts or you should not be authorizing that activity to proceed. And then on top of this, they made a provision for the states and regional fisheries management organizations to report back to the United Nations General Assembly on how they were doing in implementing this global call for better protection of our deep sea uh, environments. And they were able at the time to utilize the scientific information coming from the Census and Marine Life Seamounts community and deep sea community to identify a suite of criterion um, to help fishers and, and others better understand what makes deep sea species more vulnerable than species they may have encountered in the pelagic or coastal zones. And that is that some of these only occur in one or two places. They are structurally complex. They're made out of fragile materials. Their um, complexity provides habitat for a number of species. Their life history traits of corals, as well as many fish, as I said, means they mature at age 35. They only start having babies after age 35. There was one in Orange Ruffy that was actually found to be 250 years old as old would have stemmed from the time of Napoleon. And hence, it's complicated. At the same time, scientists and states at the Convention on Biological Diversity were developing similar criteria that could be applied most anywhere in the marine environment, but were designed in these age source um, scientific criteria and guidance, guidance, specifically with examples how these criteria could be applied in the open ocean and the deep sea. 
and help to design criteria and guidelines for actually developing representative networks of marine protected areas. It was hoped at the time that the sectoral organizations would help take these criteria into account to improve their management. In 2010, as many of you may be aware, the Convention on Biological Diversity Conference of Parties adopted the so-called Aichi targets, global targets for how we can live in harmony with nature, the steps we need to take by 2020 if we are to achieve that harmony by 2050. So by 2010, 2020, they ex were hoping that at least 10% of coastal and marine environments would be conserved through effectively and equitably managed marine protected areas that were also ec ecologically representative and well connected. And of course, this is not just about marine protected areas. This is also about integrating biodiversity into um, sustainable harvesting of fish, make sure that all fish species are at ecologically safe levels and are harvested in a way that avoids destructive impacts, controlling pollution, um, controlling the invasive alien species that we now know can truly affect the open ocean through the proliferation of sargassum weed across the southern Atlantic, management of pressures on coral reefs and other vulnerable ecosystems to climate change, and of course, carbon stocks. How are we doing on these targets? Well, we haven't done as well as we need to, but we need to keep raising the the goalposts. We need to keep pushing forward if we are going to achieve those long-term um, goals, needs, and objectives of truly living in a life in harmony with nature, one that respects biological limits as well as one that respects the needs for humans to feed themselves. But we need a better balance as we go forward. We need the life support systems that marine biodiversity can provide. So coming back to the United Nations General Assembly uh, and the UN BB&J Working Group that was established also in 2006 when they were grappling with deep sea bottom fisheries, that was, they said, okay, we also need to be looking at what do we do to better manage our biological heritage um, in the open ocean and deep sea from impacts other than deep sea bottom fishing. So they set up this working group to study what are the problems, what are the current management measures in place, and what more could be done. When they started talking about what more could be done, it was when they started talking about the possibility of a new international legally binding agreement for marine biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction. But not all states were on board yet. Some said the treaty should only deal with marine genetic resources because their key concern was marine genetic resources of the seafloor should be considered part of the common heritage of humankind and the benefits shared equitably. Um, other governments were concerned about the conservation um, angle and really wanted that representative network of marine protected areas. Others, including the United States, brought up, well, we have other tools that we can use to ensure sustainable use such as environmental impact assessments. So it was only in 2011 that states came together to recognize that we need to be talking about all four issues as a package, including capacity building and technology transfer, because capacity building and technology transfer is gonna be essential to enable all states to achieve their goals with biodiversity conservation, protection, study, use, and enjoyment. So I'm going to take a step back now, if you will, and look at what are or what were the existing tools for better conserving marine biodiversity back in 2011. And this comes from a presentation from a colleagues uh, from a workshop. We were looking at how do you apply this concept of ecologically or biologically significant areas in the open ocean, in the pelagic environment, are there actually distinguishable realms? And the answer, of course, is yes. Um, but this was the uh, way to inform the scientist about what the options were. Areas of particular environmental interest that had been established already in the Pacific by the International Seabed Authority, where those only covered certain areas of the seafloor uh, in the context of seabed mining. World Heritage Sites, operating under the World Heritage Convention, 
Well, they yet had no procedure for designating World Heritage Sites of outstanding universal value in areas beyond national jurisdiction. Although, of course, there's no reason that World Heritage stops at the 200 nautical mile exclusive economic zone. Vulnerable, vulnerable marine ecosystems that we've just been learning about, well, they only apply to discrete areas of the sea floor um, that are at risk of damage by bottom contact gear. And then the International Maritime Organization dealing with international fisheries had developed this concept called particularly sensitive sea areas, initially designed for coastal areas at risk of ship collisions or concentration of pollutants, um, but could be applied in, in areas beyond national jurisdiction, but had not been to date. And then the, um, the CBD was developing this concept of ecologically or biologically significant areas, but these were recognized to have no legal teeth, no legal significance. They're not an MPA, but they were, as I said, hopefully going to inform the identification of some of these other areas, but as we have seen in practice, have not really been able to serve that purpose. Um, and then marine migratory species networks, convention on migratory species, which deals traditionally with terrestrial species, finally started to realize it needed to address marine migratory species. And you can't address marine migratory species by only focusing on waters and species within national jurisdiction. Because as we learned in the census of marine life, that species even like elephant seals, the females, spend 70% of their time on the high seas. So international cooperation is essential. And then the scientists looked at the work on the BBNJ, the discussions there, and there's a real hope that these can make coherent the um, larger system that these provide a basis for, but actually start protecting on a systematic representative basis for vulnerable species and ecosystems as were described in the EPSA criterion. So the exciting news was in 2015, governments did finally agree on the need for a legally binding instrument. This wasn't going to be another voluntary program like we've um, had for land-based sources of pollution, which has resulted unfortunately in ever increasing masses of plastic and chemical pollution invading our coastal zones as well as the high seas. So again, they recognized the need for the, um, for the package deal. All the governments were on board, including the United States, the G77, the EU, and Russia. And what they agreed was another two-year preparatory committee, remember they've been going on since 2006, to talk about and create substantive recommendations as the basis for the new instrument. Um, that would be based on this package deal and that the legal agreement and this process would not undermine existing institutions and agreements. And they gave the UNGA themselves a deadline of 2017 to decide which way to go forward on a legally binding agreement. Were we ready or not? So I'm excited to say in 2017, the governments did get together and they finally agreed both in this um, preparatory commission and at the United Nations General Assembly to launch negotiations for the new agreement. And this is, of course, the secretariat who sits at the front of the room leading the discussions. So where are we now, 2020? Um, well, we're sort of hanging in midair. We've had three meetings over the past two years. The president of the um, Intergovernmental um, Conference has issued a draft text and then a revised draft text of what this BBNJ agreement could look like. And governments are currently talking about, both formally and informally, ways to try to bridge some of the differences that remain. That was, so I'd like to say we're hanging in mid-air, mid-stream, but everybody has their feelers up and is looking into the past for where we have been, because we're hoping when we do meet in ideally March of 2021, that we will start together um, to be able to address many of these outstanding issues that have already been defined in the draft text. Just to make sure you're briefly familiar with how a draft text is organized, there's a section for definitions, um, all the definitions in the agreement, and then part three of the agreement contains the objectives. 
the mechanisms for international cooperation and coordination, consultation, and so forth. There's another part of the agreement, part four, that talks about environmental impact assessments and the various processes and steps that are involved in that process. What are the criteria for screening? Um, a requirement to conduct an environmental impact assessment. How do you scope it? Who do you involve? Do you include public consultation processes? Do you include scientists outside your country to make sure that you're really asking all the right questions? And then some of us are looking at case studies of what future activities may emerge in areas beyond national jurisdiction, from ocean geoengineering to new types of aquaculture or human settlements, and trying to see how can these provisions really address these unheard of or unconceived of activities um, in the future 20 years. And so to future-proof the agreement, many are looking to complement the role of environmental impact assessments, which are generally project level, site-specific, and will hopefully build on the best practices of the BB&J agreement by strategic environmental assessments that can provide a better view of the potential impacts of a new technology by looking at a strategic scale or even a regional scale um, and bring in the other states, stakeholders, and um, scientific community to make sure that there is a solid basis for understanding not just the impacts in this one small corner, but what the regional and global scale impacts could be of a new activity, or what even the activities could be in the neighboring state or the neighboring protected area. I'm really excited about the regional environmental assessment process because I'm on the advisory board of this uh, EU-funded project called the iAtlantic, which is an integrated ecological assessment for the Atlantic Ocean Basin that includes scientists from the region and for the first, one of the rare times, not the first time, includes scientists from the South, from South Africa, from Namibia, from Brazil and Argentina. It's an opportunity to start designing a scientific program together from the ground up to inform how we better manage our own marine environment. I'm gonna pause here to let the uh, interpreters and um, all of you catch your breath before we go on to part three, but not for long. That's, um, again, I'll come back to this map uh, from the Census of Marine Life and one of the ground stones, um, cornerstones, if you will, of that global map. And this was a tagging and tagging tracking project that was spearheaded in many ways out of California, but also from scientists up and down the coast of the United, western coast of the United States, as well as our counterparts on the other side of the ocean. And this was where you really saw the advancement of technology for tagging individual species from, um, as I said, northern elephant seals to sharks to tuna as they made their way across ocean basins or sub-ocean basins, you started to understand what sort of habitat requirements they had. Do they, they like rough waters? Do they like smooth, calm uh, waters inside of gentle eddies? Um, sea turtles like gentle waters um, that are swirled together by eddies. Unfortunately, that's where many plastics also gather, accumulate, and concentrate. Uh, so this really gave us an insight into the niche, the habitat requirements for many of these key species. And that could be then used to inform um, the CBD efforts to bring together regional and global expertise. If you look at this map here, the range of species going back and forth across the North Pacific, well, that was then picked up in this North Pacific transition zone and bordering currents. If you're wondering why it has this funny color here, it's because the scientists recognized that it actually changes position over time, over the year and over um, cycles, and that you want to find some way to depict that these things are not steady state, but need to be managed as a dynamic, changeable feature. So giving names to areas in the high seas of what used to be a dull, flat, white, plane, well, that I saw from outside the window of my airplane, 
really for me starts to bring the high seas and the deep seas to life. Kimlar started on a different approach. They started through a series of bioregionalizations. This is where you're trying to identify areas of the marine environment that are more alike, and then where those, if there are, discrete boundaries where environmental conditions are so different that a different range of species occur or habitat types occur. And so this is the um, first result that was from a workshop in 2007 based on some prior work by Susie Grant and others in 2006 that I understand you have already heard a webinar about. Um, so for me, it was very exciting because it combined this effort to do a real robust representative approach to identifying future marine protected areas. But then as we, our knowledge gaps were filled with new information, you can start to get more site specific. We'll get to that towards the end. Kamlar, this conservation uh, Convention for the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources that you have also heard about, uh, has often been the um, leader, the forerunner, if you will, of bodies charged with managing fisheries on an ecosystem basis, but also charged with protecting areas, conserving areas for conservation purposes as well as for science. The parties to Kamlar took this um, authority mandate and built up objectives for what a system of marine protected areas would look like. And what is exciting for me is that it showed they understood the importance of protecting representative examples of marine ecosystems, biodiversity, and habitats, because you can't protect biodiversity as a whole without looking at how it's distributed across the ocean planet but also the need to protect key ecosystem processes. Some areas are more highly productive, like um, the, the areas right next to um, coastal areas where they're receiving more productive waters or ice sheets. Um, protection and establishment of scientific reference areas, a critical tool now to monitor and manage the impacts of fishing activities, but also of, to see how ocean acidification, global warming is really affecting these areas. And then of course, protection of areas vulnerable to the impact by human activity, such as those vulnerable, vulnerable marine ecosystems of the sea floor, but hopefully also of the water column above. And the protection of features critical to the function of local ecosystems, looking at the dependence of penguins on krill, for example, and then the protection of areas to maintain climate resilience. And this, in many ways, have sure served as the blue plate for how many of us would like to see a system of marine protected areas going forward. Because, as I said before, we have learned increasing amount of um, information about the fundamental importance of well-protected marine protected areas, i.e. where few, if any, human activities are permitted, if they are going to actually serve the purposes that we hope they will, which is to promote genetic diversity, protect the fish stocks, protect the penguin stocks, make sure they have the resilience, the genetic diversity they need to respond to a changing climate, to provide the stepping stones for climate migrants, increase population sizes. All of these really contribute to maintaining planetary resilience, institutional resilience, as well as ecological resilience. Uh, my colleagues in the World Commission on Protected Areas have helped to document that the more protected an area is through no-take, non-extractive areas, the more benefits they provide to the oceans and to people. And that the fundamental characteristics of a marine protected area, if it is to be effective, it means to focus on nature as a priority, being designed to achieve the long-term conservation of nature and associated ecosystem services. It doesn't end when one species is recovered because you're trying to maintain the entire ecosystem into the future. But what do you do about species that move? Um, colleagues shared this gif with me, I'm just learning how to use them, um, but sea turtles have long fascinated me, um, in part because they're those uh, migratory warriors, if you will, that also spend their lost years in the Sargasso Sea, which is this floating habitat on the surface of the sea in the Mid-Atlantic Ocean. Um, 
but we're also understanding, growing to understand that the ocean is dynamic in and of itself, and we need to find ways to adapt our management approaches to reflect that dynamism of species, of currents, of eddies like these that may shift and go in and out of existence on a periodic basis, but serve as important avenues for animals like um, sharks and sea turtles to travel on. Thank you very much, Christina, for revealing such a difficult but important topic. So, dear friends, if you have any questions you would like to direct to Christina, please fill out the form below. We will collect the questions and send them to Christina and publish them on the website here as soon as we got the answers. So, please welcome back to the lectures. and. Uh, we also would like to thank one of our project partners, the Antarctic and Southern Ocean Conservation Coalition, for their help in developing the lecture topics.